Um, so now on to tonight's uh, talk. So just to say a little bit about where this actually originally came from. Um, in 2018, um, just before COVID, in the Townscape, we had started um, a wee project with uh, this more comprehensive school. And uh, the, the, teacher, the art teacher had approached us and said she'd like to do a project around print and design. So we sort of thought, well, what could we do? So we approached an artist called Robert Peters. And uh, Robert came up with the idea of uh, printing um, a design uh, inspired by Lurgan on the tea towels. And this was fantastic because as I mentioned at the start, Lurgan essentially was built on linen. And so the idea of uh, taking the architecture of Lurgan, uh, getting the kids to design or create designs inspired by the architecture and putting it onto a linen tea cloth was almost a <coughs> very symbolic way of combining the two together. Um, when we done the tea towels, we decided to get them printed locally or to use a local company. And uh, so we went to McCaw Allen. And uh, the man I really have to say a huge thank you is Douglas Mowbray, and he's sitting at the back. Um, I've known Douglas going back a few years. We've done a couple of linen projects together. And I sort of said to Douglas, is there any chance you get these uh, designs printed onto linen? And uh, Douglas got us a wee deal sorted. He gave us uh, some uh, linen that was in McCaw Allen's uh, uh, storage. And the tea towels are actually just in the just as you enter, you'll see see the designs um, that, that that the students have produced. But when, in the process of that, Douglas then said, "Well, we have an archive of tea towel designs that McCall Allen have been doing for over 50 years." So Douglas then brought out some of the uh, tea towels which you see around us. There must be well over 200, maybe 300 uh, designs. There's only a fraction here. And when Robert uh, Peters, the artist, seen them, he said. You know, we have to do something with them. We can't just put them back into a box. Because when you look around, they're just these pops of color. They're almost works of art in, in, their, in, in, their, in their style. And in fact, they were all sort of produced by artists, the original designs. You can see some of them in the folders here. So from that, we then, uh, Robert uh, contacted uh, Robert Martin in the art space. That led to the exhibition in May. And then when the Linen Biennale was announced for August, we decided we would hold it here in Lurgan. And then we will also be holding it in uh, the Armagh Marketplace Theatre uh, in, Ar in, in Armagh in uh, January to March, where the full 300 tea towels will be on display. Mm -hmm. So that's how this sort of uh, came, came about. And uh, the thing with linen, it sometimes can be quite white, quite beige. This is a fantastic, colourful tribute to the real skill and, and, uh, and creativity of uh, the craftsman and McCallan. So just want to say a big thank you to Douglas uh, for really without him, this wouldn't have happened in this talk. It uh, wouldn't have happened. And I'm going to ask everyone to give a big <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> so to tell us a little bit more about McCallan and the tea towels around us, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Fiona McKelvey. Um, you'll each have a little booklet um, on, your, on your chair. Um, I had to put out a few more chairs there, so I'll get a few more booklets for those uh, who, who uh, uh, got those extra seating. But uh, Fiona very kindly uh, done a wee bit of research into the history of McCallan and also into the, the tea towel designs, which she put together in an essay form within that uh, lovely uh, produced uh, booklet. And uh, she's going to give us a little bit more information on top of what's in that booklet. So Fiona, I'm absolutely delighted you could join us today. And I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. Well, lovely to see so many of you here this evening. And can I echo um, just what David said to say thanks to that man in the second row to the back for all his time in helping me put not only the talk together with the information that he provided, but the booklet that you have on your seats. Um, Douglas was very generous, both with his time and his stories. So um, this project would have not been the same without him. <laughs> um, I've worked in the textile industry for longer than I care to admit to. I started work with Liberties in 1982. Having studied French and German at university, I then went on to become involved in the textile export trade. And I've known McCaw Allen since those early days because I'm rarely without a Liberty handkerchief, just like this one. And um, back then, those were being made by McCaw Allen. They still are today. So I think we're, um, we're celebrating a company with its, its longevity, its connection and collaboration with really important global brands. And I'd like to take you right back to where it all started. Um, we 
We'll begin in Tagnevin at the original building. The McCaw family had been involved with the linen industry since around about the 1830s, 1840s. And um, it was some years before it would become McCaw Allen. Um, in 1904, a partnership was formed between R.J. McCaw and Harry Allen. And as I mentioned in the booklet, it's probably what we would call today the dream team. They were very complementary in their skills that they brought to the business. R.J. McCaw had um, a real skill when it came to production and to the administration um, of the, the products and the company. He was very gifted in seeing what was happening with technology and bringing that to the firm to help them increase, increase their sales. But he couldn't have done it without, of the help, without the help of his former schoolmate, Harry Allen, who was a very different character. He was, a, as with many salespeople, he was larger than life and um, quite a character. Um, he refused to go along with the norms of how a salesman should dress. In those days, in the early 1900s, he would have been expected to wear a morning coat when going to visit department stores. And I know from my own experience, having um, been a salesperson visiting Harrods, that it was always expected, as late as the 80s, 90s, and even still today, that you would go in through the tradesman's entrance at the back door. That was not going to do for Harry Allen, who would walk through the front door with his sample case, wearing a Donegal tweed coat and hat. So he certainly wasn't going to be easily forgotten. He spent most of his time based in the London office, and there he was able to um, grow collaborations uh, with the, the key companies of the day. Um, so yes, very much the dream team whose skills worked so well together and that partnership was founded in 1904. The picture that we see here shows the staff outside the factory at that, at that particularly auspicious date of the beginning of what was to be over 100 years of the firm. And I think what's really quite interesting is we have here on the table behind me, and you can have a look later, is the same a photograph taken of staff, but 50 years later. Um, what was absolutely wonderful was the loyalty of the staff from McCaw Allen. And there are many people who appeared in that first photograph who also appear in the second one. Um, but we know now a little bit about where McCaw Allen began, but I think it's also important to know where linen comes from. Where does linen begin? And we need to take a look at this little blue blossom, or the wee blue blossom, as it's affectionately known in this part of the world. Um, this is the flower of the flax plant, which begins to bloom about 80 days after it is planted. And it only lasts for a day, and then the petals will fall to the ground. And about 20 days after the bloom starts, it's then ready for harvest. Its Latin name is Linum usitatissimum, or linen most useful. It has such a wide range of uses. Um, the, a field of flax in bloom is really quite an amazing sight, and it would have been very commonplace in this part of the world. In County Down, and County Antrim, it would have been a very common sight, probably about three or four weeks earlier than this. Um, it would normally be harvested around about um, the second week in August, generally. But there are country folk who will talk of waterfowl trying to land on a field of flax. And I think when you see this intense blue bottom right, you can understand how they might be uh, a little bit confused. But there's the vocabulary connected to the making of linen is really interesting. You've got so many unusual words, not so much pulling, but the flax plant has to be pulled rather than cut. And then retting, which is the um, process by which it's soaked in water to allow the fiber to be released from the woody stalk of the straw. You've got scutching and hackling, two more processes which happen to the, the dried straw once it's been retted. You've got spreading and roving, which happen once it goes to the large mill where the fabric, where the uh, fiber is teased out and spread and then roved before spinning and weaving and then finally bleaching and beetling. I mean, some of these words are really quite 
magical. And if you think of, um, these are only uh, 10 of the words, but there are plenty more besides that are very specific to, um, to the spinning and weaving of this wonderful cloth. But I think it might be quite useful just to see, um, and it might surprise you, a cross section of a stalk of flax. Those little kidney bean shapes around the outside, those are actually the fiber bundles. They're not in the center of the plant, as you might expect, but they're around the outside, just with one fine layer of wood around the outside. So in the center, you have another woody layer, and in the very center, you've got the pith, or pectin, that's actually holding everything together. I've actually just grown my first, not field of flax, but raised bed of flax. I wanted to see it through from beginning to, to harvest. And after some of the rain and wind that we've had in the last month, I used to come out in the morning expecting it to be absolutely flattened, but oh no, standing upright with that little blue blossom cheekily looking at me every morning saying, nope, still here, um, still standing tall. It's really quite remarkable. So when it's been pulled, it then is dried and then it's retted. So that allows the, the pith and the pectins to be um, degraded and you can pull the fiber out of the stalk. But to do that, you have to have it scutched. And this is a short clip. It's a company called McConville's who are near Dromore. And I don't know if any of you have ever visited there, but it's, um, it's been run as a, it's really a working museum nowadays. And they show you the old ways that all of these processes were done. And here you'll see Felix McConville holding a hank of flax up against almost, I would describe it like a propeller. It's a series of rotating wooden blades. Um, and that will beat away the, the woody parts of the, of the stem. How on earth you don't lose fingers and thumbs, I don't know. But it's, um, it's a fascinating process to watch. Um, and this is actually the last of the, what I would call the agricultural processes. And after this had been done, it would then move to the factory. Now we've got the hackling. Now, if you think somebody getting their hackles up or the hackles rising on the, the neck of an animal, and that actually comes from this process because hackling means you are pulling the scutched flax through um, an upright block of pins of different grades so they'll get more and more, um, more, and more fine as the, the hackling bench as you move along. But that's these upright, very sharp pins that stand up and this was a very skillful job, possibly the most skillful in the whole process because the chap who was hackling this could tell immediately what the quality of the yarn was. So it would be pulled through the combs, combed to all intents and purposes, and the short fibers would, be, would fall away. Those were known as toe fibers, which would be used for making rope or for making coarser qualities of cloth. So this would be done um, repeatedly until you come to a piece of hackled flax, which looks like this. So I think there's not much, um, you know, there's no way that you're going to be confused as wondering where flax and hair comes from. This is actually um, a photograph that I took at the Irish Linen Museum in Lisbon some years ago. And the sheen from this, you know, amazing hackled flax is really quite, quite remarkable. So once that process is finished, it goes to be spun, um, and then it goes to be woven. So you come to a yarn winding room. Um, top left is a photograph taken in about 1905. Um, and this would have been happening here in Lurgan, as well as in uh, Lisburn and many other parts of the country, and of course in, in Belfast. But I think what's a shame in a way is that um, certainly from the, the Lurgan point of view, is that everyone always hears about Belfast being Linenopolis or um, Lisburn being where the Huguenots came to start weaving linen. But actually, Lurgan doesn't really get as much of a look in as it should. And there are certain documents from the 17 and early 1800s which describe Lurgan as the cradle of the linen industry. So I think to, to be able to bring something like this back home is, is really quite important. So the yarn would be wound, top left, as I say, photograph about 1905, so round about the time McCaw Allen was um, founded. 
And on the right, while it's not in a linen mill, this is actually a photograph I took a couple of years ago at a silk damask weaving uh, mill in Suffolk. And as you can see, the process has barely changed, apart from the outfit that the, uh, the operative is wearing. So it would be put onto bobbins, and then it would go to the weaving shed or the weaving factory. You can see how closely packed the machines were. And this image is not a damask weaving um, shed, it's weaving plain cloth. Um, much of the linen would have, the very fine linen would be spun into a plain cloth, but then equally it would go to be woven into damask for which Northern Ireland is particularly well known. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor of, of the process that's involved with that, um, a lot of it was being done by hand here in Lurgan in early days. Um, but then with the invention of the Jacquard loom, it was being done by power looms. But whatever, whichever way it was being woven, there were certain processes that needed to be done. First of all, the designers would draw the pattern onto a point paper, which looks a bit like graph paper. And from that, you would create um, a series of punched cards, which were actually the precursor to computer punched cards. So textile weaving was way ahead of, of the computer as we, as we think of it today. So these banks of cards that you see on the right would then operate the loom. Where there was a hole, the weft thread could be raised, and where there wasn't, it would stay in place. And that would allow the shuttle to go back and forth, creating the pattern in the cloth. But rather than me try and describe it, I'm going to show you um, a short clip taken in this a silk weaving damask factory in uh, Sudbury. And what you'll actually see is you will see the cards going across the top, and then you'll see the green warp threads being raised and lowered. And I think that'll give you a sense of how the process actually happens. It'll also give you a sense of the noise. Um, there would have been up to 500 machines of this type in any one area. <laughs> So you can see the cards are going across the top of the loom. And there's the warp thread going up and down. Each card um, relates to one thread going back or forward. Hence the need for so many, so many of these cards. Um, but nowadays, of course, all of this is done by computer. Um, here is a, a weaving factory weaving damas today. A bit faster, no less noisy. But people nowadays will wear ear defenders, so they will have some protection, whereas back in the day, that was not, not the case. Um, but nowadays, no point chart needed. The design still has to be created but it's done on a CAD system, computer-aided design, and then it translates immediately. It's just transferred straight over to the loom. So um, a much, much quicker and less labor-intensive process. The other thing that I thought might be quite useful to see is a close-up of a piece of damask. Um, so you can see the lengthwise threads, which are the orange-colored threads. And you can see where the uh, gold thread passes either under or over. So where it passes over the thread, then you'll get over the uh, warp rather, you will get the gold color sitting on top of the design. Where it passes under, you get the orange color. And that's what creates your pattern. If you turn it over, it's the complete reverse. Now, I could have shown you this on a piece of white damask, but you wouldn't have seen very much. So I hope you'll excuse the fact that it's on silk rather than, rather than on linen. So that's your, that's your weaving process finished then the fabric would be bleached. And this is a fairly typical scene in a field in and around a weaving factory from the 1950s. Um, sometimes today when you drive through the countryside, you'll see these sort of polytunnels laid out. And I often think that's what it must have, what it must have looked like. Um, it's just remarkable that as late as the 1960s and even the early 70s, you were still finding grass bleached linens, particularly linen sheets. Um, and it's remarkable to think that such a, a very old-fashioned way of finishing was still being used. 
uh, but it was also actually labeled on the boxes. I'm very fortunate to own a couple of pairs of box sheets which, where it says grass bleach linen on the label. And the very last process is beetling. Now, Irish linen has a very distinctive sheen and that is produced by the process of beetling, whereby the fabric, um, the threads are pulled together um, through this process. The fabric is woven on something that's rather, it's called a beam and it's rather akin to a tree trunk. Um, the fabric is wound onto it and then it's rotated very, very slowly beneath um, the beetles, which is a series of very, very heavy wooden hammers which fall onto it. So they close the fibers and give the, give the sheen at the same time. And this is actually the last company, the last beetling engine in use in the world today. This is one of three operating in Upperlands for William Clark's. <laughs> You can see it pounding the cloth beneath. Again, you were deaf if you were working in the in the beetling shed within a, within a couple of within a couple of weeks. Um, once the fabric has been finished, it then has to be decorated. Some fabrics were left completely plain, for example, for a plain bottom sheet that would just have been hemmed. But for many other items, there were decorative processes that had to be taken into account. The interesting thing about McCaw Allen, which gave them a point of difference, was that they were what was known as a merchant converter. So they, as merchants, they bought in the finished linen, and then, as the word suggests, they converted it into a finished product. And one of the very typical processes that, were that was used by McCaw Allen was drawn thread work. In and around the early years of the 1900s, around 1912, um, it's reckoned that there were around 1,400 outworkers working in the immediate Lurgan area who were producing this type of work. Um, the factory would send linen as far afield as Rathfryland and Hilltown to uh, get to the women who were the most skilled in this kind of work. This image is actually taken from a linen sampler which is held in the Ulster Folk Museum. And this is fairly typical of um, the outworker would have their version um, and then the identical one would be held within the company and they would be told which pattern to create. Um, and one of the very exciting things that Douglas produced from a box the first day I visited him was this piece, which is an actual linen sampler that was used by McCaw Allen to give instructions to their outworkers for which pattern was, was required. And you can probably just about make out down the side here um, in Indian ink, the numbers one to 11. So as you can see in this close up, the outworker would have received instructions to make 10 pillowcases of number nine or 12 um, sheets with the edge or pillowcases with the edging number 11. And I'm very fortunate to own um, two pairs of some of the very last uh, pillowcases that were done by hand for McCaw Allen. I haven't, I haven't slept on these yet, but I will do someday. But they're just incredible to look at. The sheen of the linen is beautiful. It's so cool and cold to the touch, absolutely beautiful. And the workmanship that's gone into creating this design is really quite spectacular. Um, Lurgan, the Lurgan area was particularly well known for its handkerchiefs. The linen that was being spun and woven here was of a particularly fine grade known as cambric, which is very, very sheer. Uh, and this would have been used by the majority of companies who were working in this area producing handkerchiefs. And one of those companies, of course, was McCaw Allen. I think it's interesting, if you go back to the mid 1800s, um, there was so much um, advance in technology happening in this area. And there was a company called James Malcolm, who were actually the first company in the United Kingdom to use a machine to produce um, handkerchief edging, the hem stitching. Um, and this created a much quicker way of producing far more handkerchiefs. Um, and it's very typical of the sort of edging that you would find on, on a box of hankies. This is a box um, of McCall Allen handkerchiefs, 
which pass through my hands. Um, I buy and sell antique linens and I really can't keep um, beautifully finished Irish linen handkerchiefs on the shelf and they're becoming harder and harder to find. But this particular box had six different designs in the one box with the label Irish Cabin. And that was the brand label that McCaw Allen used for their linens. Um, the linen product was Irish Cabin and the smaller amount of cotton goods were with the brand name Irish Abbey. But to have a little closer look, um, this is a set, one of a set that I acquired very recently. And I mean, to look at the detail, you know, you've got these tiny, tiny seed stitches. You've got um, drawn thread details. You've got the beautiful hem stitched edge. And this has all been done by hand on one handkerchief. It really is quite remarkable. It was, and then they, they were folded and put into their box by someone who was known as an ornamenter, or I'm, I've even been told they were called a fancy folder. Um, so beautifully folded and pinned into, into shape. And it's almost, sometimes it's almost a shame to take them, to take them out of the box. But you get um, more detail even, even than that one on the other one that was in the box of six I acquired recently. The, the, the drawn thread work here is just so fine um, and all of this raised work. Um, and to think that, you know, before the advent of electric light, a lot of this was being done in the early 1900s by women sitting outside their homes. Um, you know, I'm sure that I'm told that the quality of the workmanship sort of suffered a little bit in the winter months when they had to come inside or the days were shorter. But this was probably before most people had access to spectacles if they needed them. And gosh, do, doing this type of work, I think you'd probably need them sooner rather than later. But these would probably have been produced in around about the 1950s or 60s. Um, so this sort of skilled work was still being done by hand at that point. And sadly, I don't think it's being done anywhere here today. But always at the heart of the McCaw Allen range was their household linens, whether that was sheets or pillowcases or kitchen textiles. Uh, and this is actually a catalog that dates from the second half of 1929, so almost 100 years ago. And you can see here on the bottom half of this page that you have various types of kitchen cloth and glass cloth. Um, the ones we would be quite familiar with, with either a blue or a green or a red stripe, either down the center or to the edge. And I think what's quite interesting on the, with the bottom uh, listing is that it tells you you can have a glass cloth, a tea cloth, a pantry cloth, a basin cloth, a house, a house made cloth, uh, and this would actually have been uh, woven in along the along the coloured border. So there was no mistaking which cloth you used for which thing. Um, and that's 1929. These are actually part of the household linen collection this year for Samuel Lamont. Um, McCall Allen now being part of the Samuel Lamont group. Now you might wonder, what is it about linen that makes it so well suited to being a tea towel? Well, most importantly, it's linen is inherently antimicrobial. So no germs will hang around when you're using a linen tea towel. It never gets smelly. Um, it wicks moisture very, very quickly. When we wear it, for example, it will wick moisture away from the body and it'll cool you down. But also, equally in the kitchen, I can hear my grandmother's voice saying, when you take a cake out of the oven or bread out of the oven, cover it with a linen cloth. Because A, it'll remove any steam, and B, it will help it cool down more quickly whilst at the same time keeping away any uh, nasties that, you know, there any flies around or anything of that sort. It's highly absorbent. It actually, linen will actually absorb 20% in its weight before it gets wet or damp. But there again, it dries really quickly. And what might be surprising is it's actually much stronger than cotton. And it's particularly strong when it's wet. 
but also when you're drying glasses or porcelain or china, it's lint free, so you're not going to get any bits of fluff. So it's the absolute perfect choice for a tea towel. It also accepts dye and color really well, as I think you can tell from what we see round about us today. So I think it was probably in a day in November last year that I arrived down into your office, Douglas, and you, he ha Douglas handed me two of the most <laughs> precious things, two ring-bound folders that were stashed with page after page after page of designs that had been produced by McCaw Allen for tea towels. Each uh, A4 sheet contained six patterns, each about the size of a playing card, and underneath was written various information relating to that particular design. So here, for example, on the right, you can see that this was a pattern of Windsor Castle, that it was seven colors, that it was last printed on the 5th of June, 1968, and that it measured 31 inches long by 21 inches wide. And then we see the initials UPW, which tells us it was printed for McCaw Allen by the Ulster Print Works. There were a number of different screen printing works who worked with McCaw Allen. McCaw Allen would supply the linen, the, uh, the company would print them, and they would be returned to be hemmed and labeled and sent, sent to the customers. So page after page of fascinating designs, some of which you'll, you'll see round about you today, over here we have um, now the king, um, then as Prince Charles, the tea towel that was produced for his investiture in Carnarvon in 1969. So last printed 16th of April, 1969. I think if I were him, I'd probably be suing the artist. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's very much in that style of commemorative tea towel of which uh, they were produced in their thousands. But it went on page after page, and it was, it was really fascinating. I was very um, privileged to be allowed to take them home with me. And I sat in my studio for about the next three days, just poring over them and really um, becoming far more appreciative of the sheer wealth of design that was included in the pages of these books. And that was just a small, very small section of what had been, what had been made. I think probably there would have been millions produced over time. Um, what better way to get your product um, into just about every home in the land, but to make it into something really very practical, the humble tea towel. Um, the, the whole linen industry was really changing at about this time. It was post-war, everyone had had enough of grey days and dismal news. Younger people wanted something more vibrant, they wanted brighter colours. They weren't really terribly keen on the, the plain white linens that their parents had known. They wanted something a bit more vibrant and a bit more colourful. And sales of um, Irish linen were really suffering at this point. Also, the invention of the, um, the Kleenex handkerchief didn't help, so the handkerchief industry found itself in quite a lot of difficulty. But Mer uh, McCall Allen was very well placed because they weren't a linen bleacher or a linen weaver, so they were able to adapt their collection to um, cater for this changing market. Uh, and that they, they were very good at reinventing um, on a number of different occasions, but this one really was... Um, the right thing to do. They had always sold their household linen, um, glass cloths and kitchen cloths exceptionally well. So come the 1950s, they thought, okay, let's um, adopt a new style and go with printed linens, which will provide the color and the vibrancy uh, at a very affordable price. And it would find its way into just about every home in the land. And it would appeal on so many different levels. And what I'd like to do really is take you through um, a number of the design themes. Now, some of these are on display tonight, uh, but um, some, are, some are not. But um, you have, you know, it was the ubiquitous flower, really. Florals were everywhere. I mean, here we see some absolutely stunning ones. And if you look closely, the detail on the petals, and you imagine that these are being screen printed, they're not being painted with a brush. Uh, but if you look in the portfolios behind me, you will see that the initial drawings were just as detailed as any painting would be. 
Um, on the left, you have a design very typical of Constance Spry, who was producing floral arrangements that were really quite sparse and very different, quite stylized, and this is very much in that sort of form. Although I'm, I have to say, I'm not quite sure what the tortoise is doing at the bottom. But um, Tortoise and Poppy, I think, is the name, the name of this one. And the one on the right, when it came to choose the, uh, the cover design for the booklet, I, this one was an absolute no-brainer, not least from the practical point of view that we had space to put McCall Al in a tea towel collection. But I just think this amazing pink color um, contrasted with the red and the green is just absolutely stunning. So yes, there were flowers aplenty without having to, to grow them in your garden. But the tea towel actually took on a quite an interesting role because it very much became a destination souvenir, if you like. So no longer did you send a postcard home, but you could take a tea towel. And these two are very typical of the sort of design that was being produced. So on the left is one of my particular favorites, not least because my very first job in London was about 150 yards round the back of one of the buildings on the left. Um, but the post office tower, when it was first opened was such a novelty. Um, it was the obvious thing to put on this style of a tea towel. You'd been to London and what's more, you'd seen the post office tower. Well, maybe you hadn't, but at least you could take granny home a tea towel. Um, but the colors again, incredibly, incredibly bright and um, full of vitality. The one on the left is actually hanging, it's hanging in the hallway on the, um, the display there towards the back. But this is again, very typical. It's the Sovereign's Escort. And the detail, this just looks like it's a row of soldiers wearing their busbies. But if you look closely, that little flash of white as the light catches on every single one and the way that the carriage is drawn, the way the horses are drawn, it really is quite remarkable to think that this has been reproduced on a linen tea towel. Absolutely stunning. So the, the tea towel became the, the ideal holiday souvenir. It was easy to pack and carry and take home. So it really was supplanting the postcard um, as, it, as it was used in this way. And I'm sure not many of us have ever been to a stately home that hasn't had at least three or four tea towels in the shop to tempt you as you leave. Um, but that's, um, that's a whole other story. Back in the 50s and 60s, we certainly didn't have Google. So if we needed information relating to recipes or food safety, where better to turn than the piece of linen you had in the drawer in the kitchen. So this is the first infographics, if you like. The design and the, the um, attention to detail that has been put into something as simple as the tea towel, but it's also going to tell you what you can cook now for later. And it says at the bottom, it says prepare double. So who thought batch cooking was a new concept? I mean, this is going back 60 years, um, it get, and, but yet it's so beautifully drawn. You've got these incredibly psychedelic pinks and browns and oranges. So this may well have just sneak, snuck into the 70s, I think. And also fresh cream in the kitchen produced for the milk marketing board, telling you all the wonderful things you can do with fresh cream. So in the perfect place, in the kitchen, what better place to put the information? They had even more detail telling you how you could eat, eat healthily and stay slim. It would give you a storage guide telling you how to, what the length of time was that it was safe to store various foods under various conditions. So you've got whether it's in a fridge, whether it's in a cold pantry or whether it's in a freezer. Um, I mean, to think that somebody was actually going to sit down and design something as visually attractive as this, simply to tell you, don't leave it in the freezer for too long or use it if it's just been in the pantry. And it's such a novel way of making information palatable, I think. I mentioned earlier that um, my first connection with McCaw Allen was through working with Liberty uh, in London. And um, these two uh, tea cloths were printed for Liberties. And as well as making Liberty handkerchiefs, um, there were many other products that brands wanted to use to promote their company, either to sell to customers or to give to potential customers. 
uh, on trade show stands, for example. And that's how um, we come across these. When I was first introduced to this project and asked if I would like to uh, be part of it, I was shown a couple of images of a number of different tea towels just to illustrate the sort of thing that was in these amazing boxes um, sitting in Douglas's office. And the thing that really struck me about these ones was that there was a, a little name on the bottom right hand corner of each, which was Raymond Stringer. I worked with Ray Stringer for eight years during my time at Liberties. To actually see his work again was just, um, um, it really took me right back. Um, he had come from New Zealand. He trained at the Royal College of Art and latterly worked for Liberties, both for the department store and then for the wholesale division where I was working. Um, these are actually from um, the late 1970s, um, I believe, but they were very typical of the time that what was done was the, uh, it was a very colorful tea towel that was printed, but it was dual purpose because it was intended that this was, it was like a kit form. So here you had a design that if you wanted to, you could cut it up and make it into a tea towel, a tea cozy, sorry, and two egg cozies. Of course, you could just use it for drying your dishes as well. But these are just two of the colorways um, with Ray's name, bottom left. And Ray's sitting up there on a cloud now thinking, did I really draw that? <laughs> uh, but he, he was very, very talented and uh, came up with some fabulous designs that McCaw Allen produced over the years. And I think what these really typify is that incredible skill of collaboration that was always um, at the heart of what McCaw Allen was doing. They were working with department stores to produce goods with them. It wasn't a, here's our range, that's what you'll buy. But perhaps there's some way that we can collaborate and we can produce something specifically for you. Um, and there were an, quite a few global brands that would come all the way to Lurgan to sit down with the design team here to ensure that they had the very best um, in the promotional products that they wanted to, wanted to use. Here are another two of Ray's designs. The one on the left was for the 80th birthday of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And the one on the right was to commemorate the um, Silver Jubilee of Her Majesty. And that could, again, could be turned into two herb pillows if you wished. So those are fairly typical of, of the Liberty designs, very much with those florals which were at the heart of, of Liberty style. But then, of course, there were the likes of Guinness. And I think we've got, yes, we've got a number of them here. Uh, and I think there are one or two outside. There was a series of about, I think there were about 10 or 12 altogether that were done for Guinness. Now, um, in this instance, as with Liberties, the, um, the company commissioning these designs would have provided the pattern. So on the right, we've got um, a, quite an amusing commemoration of the 900th anniversary of the Battle of Hastings. So you've got Battle of Hastings 1066, bottle of Guinness 1966. And if you look very closely to the top right hand corner, he doesn't have a club or a lance in his hand, he's got a pint of Guinness. So a very amusing way of um, drawing attention to your product whilst at the same time uh, commemorating a historic event. But it didn't just stop with Guinness. I mean, the list, the list went on and on. You have, so you've got Guinness, you have Thames Television, for example. This is familiar, I'm sure, to many of you at the end of a, a TV program as the, after the credits have gone up. And actually, a really good friend of mine in London was working for Thames TV when this was produced. And she was selling their products, uh, their television shows, all over the world. And she said, I can remember when these arrived at the exhibition stand, and we were able to hand them out to buyers from South America, from Germany. They found their way all over the globe. Some are slightly more unusual. I, these ones really caught my eye because there was so much detail in them. So you might think, why would you want a tea towel of Swindon? <laughs> or Croydon, for that matter. I lived only about four miles from Croydon up until last year. Um, but these were produced on behalf of the Debenhams department store group. So they wanted each store to have something unique to them. So you'd be in Debenhams and you'd be overwhelmed to think, oh my goodness, I can remember Swindon. I can take home a tea towel. But if you look at the detail that's included, um, and I think, I think I'm right that these were actually designed in-house 
from um, places that would have been given to the design studio and say, well, you know, there's this church and there's this town hall and, and there's this park. Can you represent that for us? So there was a series of about 16 of these produced over the years, um, all to promote the department store. Who thought the Canals and Rivers Trust might have a need for tea towels? But there again, there are quite a few of them on display here tonight. Roses and castles, very typical of the designs that would have been found on the enamel, jugs and plates that would have been traditionally used on canal boats when they were trading up and down the rivers. Um, and I think once the leisure activity of going boating took over from the trading that would have happened on the canals, this was an ideal way to... Um, again, impart information to the potential customers. Well, hopefully it would be quiet waters and you didn't have somebody in the next barge who was playing loud music. But then you have details on the right of the many different styles of barge. And if you've never been on a barge holiday before, you might need to know about the canal code or how to operate canal locks. So I can only presume that these were being placed in each boat before the, uh, the novice renter turned up to, uh, to take control. And of course, the WI. Um, this one is full of very useful information. It must have been, I think, around about the time of decimalization. Um, obviously, you've got decimalization in the center, but you've also got measurements. You've got Fahrenheit to Celsius. You've got dry weights and fluid measures. Again, the infographic, but for um, a hugely uh, important organization to so many uh, who would otherwise have spent their time in the kitchen. And also, shall I say, the Mother's Union, who would have had many different tea towels produced over the years. Um, and then we have the whimsy. We have the whimsical. I, I have a funny feeling that maybe these type of designs was a veiled attempt to try and get your children to help with the drying of the dishes. I'm not sure it necessarily would have worked, but little Bo Peep and little Boy Blue, um, the ugly ducks, ducklings on the top right. I mean, the vivid colors and the charming designs on these are just delightful. Then we come on to the heritage that I mentioned earlier. So you go to your stately home or you visit several stately homes. So you've got the key great houses in, in England. You've got gates and um, archways in London. And in the center, it's actually this one here. You've got the, the plague village of Eam in Derbyshire, which was um, commemorating the very forethinking way that they tackled the bubonic plague back in the 1600s. They thought to isolate the village once they realized what was happening. So they were doing lockdowns long before any of the rest of us had to. Um, but again, being commemorated on a yearly basis by, by the village. McCaw Allen, as well as collaborating, was gaining um, quite a reputation for being a leader in its field. Um, and there's a little telltale label on some of these tea towels. Certainly this historic houses one is just by the doorway um, on the right. Uh, and this is telling us that the design had been selected by the Design Centre of London. Now, the Council of Industrial Design was set up in the 1940s to celebrate the excellence of design in products all types of products from machinery to soft goods to household textiles. And tea towels that were produced by McCaw Allen were featured in the shop that they opened in Haymarket in London. Uh, it opened in 1958. Um, and if your product was stocked in that shop, it meant it had been specifically selected for excellence in design and quality. And there were numerous occasions where this coveted uh, motif was attached to a McCaw Allen tea towel. So yet again, um, from small beginnings, working away in Lurgan with skill and uh, intelligence and foresight, they were absolutely on the world stage at, with the best of design and product. But I think we need to pay attention to the skill that was actually used in producing the artwork to make these wonderful pieces that we see. Um, for each color, so if you have a seven color design, you need seven different screens 
to achieve the, the finished pattern as it's being printed, and each one is printed separately. So before computer-aided design, this would all have been done by hand. It was very painstaking work. And this image on the left, you can see a young woman working on the design, the finished version of which you see bottom right. Um, I'm not sure how many there are in that, but I would su suggest probably about seven or eight. So a separate screen for each one, and the colors are laid down in, in order. One of the Liberty tea towels is actually the perfect example. And um, this one, unfortunately, is not on display at the moment, but it's another of Ray's expert designs. And this was for Miss Liberty. And if you decided to cut up your tea towel, this is what you would achieve at the end of it. So that's just one, that's the colorway on the right, I think. Um, so there she is in all her glory with a little bow at the back and, and her hair. So you can see there are four colors in this design. And if you have a look later in the portfolios behind me, you'll see these four acetate um, drawings, which would have gone towards the making of the screens. Uh, and that's how this particular textile would have been achieved. The picture on the left, the black and white photograph, was taken in 1949. And that is at the Belfast Silk and Rayon, work, Rayon Works, where many of these early tea towels were printed. Sadly, none of the screens exist today, but what you can see on the right are the types of screens that would have been used to produce the designs. And that really brings us full circle. Um, whilst none of the screens are available, um, much of the, or many of the designs that would have been produced, we sadly no longer have any record of. But I think what we can see here um, and what you have in the, in the portfolios really gives you a superb sense of the skill, the variety, the collaborations that the company made um, at a time when otherwise everyone was talking about the demise of the linen industry. And it's still alive and kicking. I, really, I, I get really quite upset when people use that word demise because there are so many exciting things going on at the moment, not least the Linen Biennale, thanks to um, Robert and Anthea at our space. Um, and I think something as uplifting as this will give us all a new sense of what we might have in the kitchen drawer at home. And don't leave it languishing there. Use it or hang it on the wall. So it only remains for me to say a huge thank you to, um, to David for asking me to talk this evening. Um, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council have been hugely supportive um, through the, uh, the efforts of the National Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, and what L Lurgan Townscape Heritage Scheme is doing, I think is really paying great attention to a, a skill and um, a tradition that shouldn't be overlooked. And finally, thanks to Samuel Lamont Group and, of course, to Mr. Mowbray for his help all the way along this process and to um, our space for uh, helping get the first exhibition off the ground and for contributing to this one. So thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, Fiona, for that uh, talk. That was fantastic and uh, great just to be able to be able to add more information, particularly uh, about Ray Stringer. It's great to have uh, one of the names of the designers there as well. Mr. Chairman, in signing the speaker, could we pay a tribute and a big tribute to the number of workers that are so loyal and so helpful to uh, McCullough and Alan Brown, and many of whom are represented behind me here in the seat here. Well, no, well, uh, everyone, can just say an, another big thank you to Fiona for her, her wonderful talk. And Fiona, thank you very much. Thank you.